Zoom recording. So once again, you do not have to attend these if you lose your internet connection or anything like that, or it just gets too lossy, it's okay. You can drop out, that's fine. If you have questions, either put it in the chat, which I think technically I point like that and you can see the chat, and or just unmute yourself and then go and ask the question and then mute yourself again. It defaults to muting you just so, you know, if there's random things going on in the background, we're not gonna hear it. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and talk to you guys a little bit about uh, protein. So it's actually really interesting because we find ourselves in a really weird situation where a lot of people are freaking out, understandably. I mean, th things are weird. You know, I am obviously not an epidemiologist, much less do I have a PhD in immunology, but what I do know a little bit about immunology is it's, you know, it's, it's scary, especially for older folks and even younger folks run some risks. But then what's interesting is what people hoarded. Um, statistically speaking, you can only live for about one to maybe nine days without water. And that's if you're in a situation where you're not sweating much. And same thing with electrolytes. That's probably what's going to kill you first. From there, when it comes to malnutrition, the first thing that actually tends to kill you is a lack of protein. It's not a lack of fat because your digestive tract is literally digesting itself every day. Everyone's losing a little bit of skin every single day and we have to keep replenishing that protein. And we take that protein out of our muscle mass. So when people unfortunately starve, they typically die of protein energy malnutrition. They rarely die of a lack of calories. So people should have been hoarding more of the meat, which they've done a decent job of from what's in the mire near my wife and I up in Lexington. But statistically speaking, I haven't seen anyone ever die of a poopy butthole. But obviously, a lot of people hoarded toilet paper, which I find fascinating. Of all the things that can kill you, a lack of toilet paper, since it was actually invented in the, in the 1800s, I, I don't understand. But I'm just a scientist. So is the volume coming through okay? The joke seemed better in my head, obviously it wasn't. Okay, so let's talk about protein. So what we have off to the side, guys, and when we're looking at, can you, you guys see my mouse and how I'm moving around? Okay, so we obviously get it in, and now this is gonna be the free amino acids. Now, free amino acids is gonna be in our bloodstream. This means it can go anywhere. Wherever we happen to be sending blood to our body, that's where we're gonna be able to take amino acids up. Now there's an issue with this system because certain tissues, like your connective tissue, your tendons, ligaments, have very, very bad, have no vascularization. So they only get the little bit of amino acids that effectively diffuse around. So that's why recovering from tendon sprains, ligament strains, takes a really, really long period of time because the tissues literally can't have as much delivered to it. Now, every tissue in our body, like I said, is currently both trying to rebuild itself while parts of it break down. So, you know, I lifted weights today. So it turns out there's a lot of muscles in my body that are currently going through protein breakdown due to the damage that happened to the Z-lines, actin, myosin, and that has to be repaired. Now, I've also turned on protein synthesis. So hopefully I'm having more synthesis than I'm having breakdown. So I have a net of muscle gain. But if I have less synthesis and more breakdown, that's where you have atrophy. Now, this can be because of nutritional reasons or because of no longer is there a stimulus on the muscle to do so. And a small amount of protein is actually gonna be used for energy. And that's when we have oxidation, which is gonna lend itself to CO2. Now, once again, we're running through protein every single day. Our immune system needs it to keep itself going and create the antibodies, which hopefully if you do get infected with the COVID, takes care of it pretty quick. And when we talk about using it for energy, what we have on the right over here, guys, is something that I will never make you memorize because it is insane, but it's important to understand that different proteins have what's known as a different R group. Now, the R group is what gives it its specificity and it gives it its unique effects on the body. Now, each of these amino acids, if you can, I know it's very small, but you can see how literally alanine, serine, cysteine, and glycine all can be converted to pyruvate, which means they can also be brought in for gluconeogenesis. Whereas when we look at our leucine, phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, and lysine, those can be converted to acetoacetate, remember our ketone bodies, which in turn will be converted into acetyl-CoA, and then that can feed into the Krebs cycle. So proteins, deamination is just gonna take the amine group, the nitrogen off of it, and they can feed into a lot of different spots, but just understand there's a lot of variability, they're all going into the Krebs cycle, and it turns out some of them can help build more glucose, most of them are just gonna be used for energy. Okay. So let's make sure we're clicking over the slides. 
Now, the smallest component that we have is just our basic amino acids. Those are gonna be transported from our interstitial cells of our GI into our bloodstream where they're then gonna be processed by the liver. They're going to sometimes be metabolized for energy. They're sometimes gonna be modified into different amino acids. And that's where we have the difference between our essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids, conditionally essential amino acids, and be sent wherever they need to be around the body. Now, protein breakdown, like I said, everything in your body is freaking falling apart. Just look at me in general and you can see how the hard ravages of ages are gonna keep coming harder for me. Turns out at once I didn't look so bad because Daniel got kicked out. So what we're going to see is these proteins are gonna break down. When you go out into the sun, when you go out and just move your body, you're always doing a little bit of microscopic damage to your body. And actually it's more on the nano level and we constantly have to repair and replenish this. So through the good old fashioned transcription translation, we're going to build those protein thanks to expression of our DNA and that's gonna be activated by a number of different forms of signaling. We're gonna to get to that later. Don't worry about that for now. Okay, now if we look at our table 8.2, you guys can see how different amino acids are going to be utilized as different precursors for a number of different components inside of our body. So where you can see how individual amino acids are going to be incorporated into things like creatine. The body produces what it needs, or hopefully what it needs every day from your liver. It just, just requires enough protein to do so. It's going to produce glutathione, which is one of the greatest, most powerful antioxidants you have in the body through three different of our amino acids. And notice taurine, which is one that you typically don't see a whole lot in the diet. And that's actually, we see sometimes supplements for energy drinks. Sorry, every time, when I, whenever somebody shows up, I have to admit them into the meeting, which I don't understand how I can do that more efficiently yet, but I'll figure it out. But when we look over on the far right, guys, notice right here is we have protein intake, okay? We have, at your average individual is actually secreting about 70 grams of protein per day, and that's in the form of all those different enzymes that are gonna allow us to digest our food. Now, in turn, most of that is going to be absorbed, a small amount of that is gonna be put into your waste. Now, what we're then going to see is a number or a decent amount of that protein is then gonna be lost through simply urine. So that's gonna be in the form of ammonia, urea, uric acid, creatinine, and this is essentially through the metabolism of protein, which how many of you guys have ever heard of creatinine before? I'm sure you guys heard of creatine. How many of you ever creatinine? All I can see right now is Jackson, Stephanie, and Becca. It looks like Becca's shooting it from her family's, her from her little, uh, sister's bedroom, Jackson is living room, and then Stephanie I, in some alleyway. Nobody's heard of creatinine before. Okay, well, Becca is interested in going on to nursing school after this, and this is an important blood biomarker. Specifically, creatinine is something that's going to occur through normal protein metabolism. Now, when you look at your average American, aka Homer Simpson, if you see elevated creatinine, they've got some protein wasted and or their kidneys are being overran and they're not able to keep up with that filtration rate. Specifically when you compare it to, hey, what's up, Bahamut? Uh, the blood urea nitrogen content, okay, B-U-N. Now, the issue is when you look at guys like myself, other individuals that carry larger amounts of muscle mass, they're naturally going to go ahead and have elevated B-U-N and creatinine levels. And that's just a natural effect of carrying more muscle mass. So when we're looking at some of these values, it's important to keep in mind context for the individual. And that's when we'll get into how some folks think of protein is gonna be the macronutrient that kills you, when in reality that's more sugar, but we're gonna stay off of me getting on my high horse. Now, notice guys, every single day, how much protein is literally going into your gut, your lung, your liver, your brain, okay? 127 grams, just running, your blood, so replenishing your white blood cells, replenishing your red blood cells, your platelets, et cetera, that tends to take up a good another 40, 50 grams. Now, it's going to be then our muscle that's taking the smaller amount. And once again, this is dealing with someone that's sedentary. These numbers are gonna increase whenever someone is obviously training hard, but the most interesting fact from whenever I was going through medical nutritional therapy is who do you think of all the people that you might run into in a hospital have the greatest protein demands? You guys can either drop in an idea in chat or at least say something out loud. 
I feel like I'm talking to myself and I don't like it. Give me a guess. Bahamut, what do you think, buddy? No, he's too busy eating dinner. Obese people. Classy, I like seniors. Now, is that seniors as in like high school, college, citizens? Nice. Not bad, not bad, guys. In all reality, it's burn victims. Burn victims actually have the greatest protein demands because every single day they're losing a certain amount of albumin and they have to literally rebuild all of that skin. And that requires massive protein demands. In fact, the original, what's known as metrics protein shakes were actually designed for burn victims as a means to giving them a massive bolus of protein to go ahead and get their intakes up. Now, the highest I've seen in the peer review that seems to have efficacy for increasing performance, not just like because you love the taste of meat, is about two and a half to maybe three grams of protein per kilogram of body mass. So a guy my size effectively is eating a little over 300 grams of protein per day. In burn victims, I've seen it as high as over 3.5 or 4 grams of protein per kilogram of body mass per day, which means for me, 400 grams, which literally means just shy of one full pound of just protein, not the water that comes with it when you're eating chicken or other ones. So now we have the slide that I normally like to terrify the grad students with, but once again, not necessary. What's more important to understand is how we can interconvert from one amino acid to another and how the body is going to allow us to go from our essential amino acids into our non-essential amino acids in that we can start with one amino acid modify it accordingly and then we're going to go ahead and have whatever amino acid we need now this is how you don't need to take in every single amino acid in order to have the positive effect but what it does allow you to do is by taking in enough of every single amino acid in the first place, you don't have to waste extra steps with the body converting from one to the other. It just makes this process a little bit more efficient. But that being said, you can be a vegetarian and eating incomplete proteins as long as you're getting enough essential amino acids every single day because you're still going to have the same amount of performance and recovery. The big key difference you might have is the fact that, well, you might not recover as fast as you would have been able to. And 1% per day doesn't make that big of a difference until we add that up over a month, a year, a decade. So there's a lot of ways that we can measure individuals' protein amino acid metabolism. We can go ahead and look at the literal amount of urea content that happens to be naturally in their blood and in their sweat. And as you can guess, it's a lot of fun to have to collect. You can then go ahead and actually literally look at individual muscle protein turnover, which requires, of course, a biopsy, so that's a lot of fun. And then we can go ahead and look at nitrogen balance, which is just simply looking at how much of a change in the total nitrogen or lean mass in the body over a long enough period of time. You can look at atrial venous differences, you can look at radioactive isotopes, stable isotopes, tracers, et cetera. There's a lot of ways to look at it, but the key is how many of you guys really plan on A, working with urine, or B, having to do venipuncture or artery puncture to look at these changes? I'm seeing a lack of enthusiasm. Okay, what do you guys think would probably be the easiest way for you to actually get a decent idea of someone's protein turnover, and nitrogen balance is the bigger concept here, in that if someone's in a positive nitrogen balance, they're increasing their total amount of nitrogen, which turns out is the major component of things like muscle. If they're decreasing their nitrogen balance, so they're in a negative, they're losing, that means they're losing lean mass. Now, looking at Stephanie right here, what can we do like in less than 10 minutes to decrease her total amount of body nitrogen? Shave her head. Your hair is just protein. So turns out you probably have a solid pound of hair with as long as your hair is. Now, I'm not saying anyone's going to come for you in whatever alleyway you're currently hiding out in in order to try to shave your head, but that would be part of the lean mass. And so when you're working with really, really, really big people, which obviously is not anyone that I'm talking to right now, when they lose a lot of lean mass, skin is lean mass. 
So if you get them to lose 100 pounds, they might lose 20 pounds of lean, but that 20 pounds of lean is actually skin because they're literally decreasing their total body size. Their digestive tract will also atrophy and decrease in size, but that still means they're in a nitrogen deficit. Now, there's nothing wrong with it as long as we're mindful of it. But if we're going to take a guy like Jackson, take a gal like Becca, and have you guys lose nitrogen, well, unless we're shaving Becca's head, it's probably because you guys are losing lean mass. There's no offense, Jackson, your goatee's not that big, okay? So that's not going to be what we're looking for. But if we're working with someone who like says 300, 400 pounds, yeah, we're going to lose some of this. So what do you guys think would be the easiest way for you guys as a practitioner to actually get an idea of somebody's nitrogen balance? You guys can unmute or you guys can throw that up in chat. Norbert, Norbert, where at, bud? Norbert, come here, buddy. Norbert, come over here. Norbert, Norbert, come on. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to Bioenergetics, buddy. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Will. Somebody said something. This is Norbert. He loves everybody. Sorry, he doesn't get to meet you guys, but he's in lockdown. You know, dogs supposedly can get this disease too. Talk about a nice extra layer of anxiety about this that we didn't have beforehand. Because you're just a big level below, aren't you? Yes, you are. Okay, good boy. Go back upstairs. Mommy's going to have fun just hanging out with you. Okay. So, question between exercise and amount of muscle they appear to have or have not have. Not bad. So, and the breathing, you could actually do that a little bit, but the key is nitrogen, you mostly lose it through sweat and you lose it through urine and obviously feces. Whereas carbohydrates and fats, we can look at that oxygen to carbohydrate, uh, the RER, you can't do that with protein. That's one of the flaws to it. But your actual best way, guys, is think body composition. Because if we know how much lean mass and fat mass you have now, and in a month from now, you've lost weight, but all you've lost is fat mass, we've managed to keep you in nitrogen balance. Or if you manage to gain weight and the only thing you've put on is lean mass and your fat mass stay the same, once again, we've got an idea that you put on lean mass. So one of your easiest ways to do this is going to be by doing body comp. But even then, it can have flaws, obviously, because you could just decide to be like, well, I mean, how many of you guys, how many of you guys currently have access to a gym? Are a lot of you guys kind of on your own body weight stuff? Kind of about that? Jackson, are you just kind of? Living on house arrest. Becca, you're just lifting your feelings. Yeah, yeah. So it turns out a lot of you guys that are well-trained, yeah, I mean, it's going to be really hard to hold on to your lean mass. Now, you can do a lot of things like push-ups, but you might not have access to a pull-up bar. So over, you know, the next hopefully only month of this that we got to do, you know, you might lose one pound of lean mass on what will effectively be your back because you can't do pull-ups but you can keep effectively on the pressing musculature because you can still at least do a bunch of push-ups, handstand push-ups if you're feeling saucy, something to actually help you keep that strength on. But if we were to just look at you and just do that body comp via something like the Tanita scale, you'd be the same. But in reality, we wouldn't see the fact that your upper body, your pressing muscles have gone up, your pulling muscles have gone down. So just something to be mindful of when we're following and tracking people. So, what about when we're talking about how much protein you need? Well, it turns out when you're an endurance athlete, it's about 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kg per day. Okay? okay. Now, when you're talking about strength athletes, it's going to be about, you can go from 1.5 to as high as I've seen 2.5. But in reality, it's probably more like 1.8. And the 2.5 is specifically when you're trying to not lose lean mass when you're on a diet. So when you're actively trying to lose fat mass but maintain your lean mass, protein becomes more important for your athlete. So the bigger key is like anything else, is we're trying to make sure that we get in enough calories 
and we get in enough protein. And if we go extra on protein, that's not necessarily a bad thing unless we're talking about an endurance athlete who's in season. Because what are they going to be able to stomach a lot easier? A, a steak or another cup of rice? And at some point, you've got to make the decision that we've got enough protein, we just need to go harder in carbohydrate. Strength athlete, that's pretty easy because you can eat dang near anything you want and you'll be okay. Your carbohydrate levels really don't matter that much. Fat's always important for everybody, but your protein requirement is going to be one that we're going to really be trying to focus on. But if you're a bodybuilder that's getting ready for a competition or a figure competitor, you've got to make sure that you keep that protein level high and you're still just trying to get in the bare minimum carbohydrates so you can still be a functioning adult and enough fat that you can also recover and at least have some semblance of normal hormone, normal hormonal production during that period. So as far as when we're working with athletes and athletes at risk, what would be some populations that you think we might have some issues with getting adequate amounts of protein in? Vegetarians and their final form of vegan. Uh, no, but you're absolutely correct. It can be really, really problematic if you don't have access to things like protein powders or you're making sure that you're, or sorry, for certain vegetarians and vegans that aren't picking higher protein sources. You can get enough protein if you're doing enough peanut butter, if you're doing enough quinoa, if you're doing enough foods that naturally have higher amounts. But if you're being like a D-bag vegetarian, so you just eat a bunch of salads and throw a bunch of salad dressing on it, and you don't really do many nuts or anything along those lines, you're going to have some issues. So absolutely. And Bree, you bring up a good point with some of the cross-country athletes. And it's not necessarily cross-country cross athletes. One of the bigger issues is athletes that are discouraged from eating in the first place. So this can be ones that have that shitty coach that told them they have to be insert this weight. And I'm sure all of you guys at least know someone or you have encountered a coach that essentially was inflicting an eating disorder on an athlete. So they're going to try to eat as minimally as possible. And they're going to be not just cutting back all the calories that they need in general, but they're also gonna be cutting back on protein. Because at the end of the day, do you need a PhD to be a coach in this country? Do you need a master's degree? And then do you even need a degree that involves exercise science or nutrition in order to be a coach? I've, did I tell you guys about the previous basketball coach here and one of the basketball players that we had? So the previous coach, which mind you guys, the last guy that was here, the guy that got fired after I think only two years and did a really shitty job, got paid $350,000 per year to be here. Literally in the two years that he was here, he will have made more than I will have made after working here for over a decade. Keep that in mind. As you can tell how I feel about this already. He got on our previous strength conditioning coach. Did you ever have Brandon, uh, Brandon Hannum as your strength coach, Jackson? Or was he here at all when you were here? He was getting yelled at by the head basketball coach because the guy on the basketball team needed to gain 20 pounds before season started so he could be an effective center. Now, I say he told me he needs to gain 20 pounds. Guess how long he gave Brandon for this guy to, gave 20, to gain 20 pounds? What do you guys think would be rational? If I told you guys to gain 20 pounds, well, damn, Will, you're, that would be a rational thing, a pound a week. So 20 weeks, two and a half months, there you go, six months, it makes, yeah, so he thought he could put all that on during preseason basketball in October with a center that's also going to be getting a lot of minutes every single game. Now, if I had to get 20 pounds on any of you guys in one month, it's going to involve a funnel, a gallon of olive oil every day, and a lot of headlocks, okay? Like, that's a miserable experience in general, and bodies don't change that quickly. But if we have an athlete that's consistently under and under and under eating for protein, well, the body triages things. The most important thing for the body to keep running 
is going to be your heart and your nervous system. After that, it's got to prioritize between your immune system, your muscular skeletal system, your, and then your digestive system. And out of those three, the first one it's actually going to sacrifice is your immune system. And because it's trying to keep up all that activity. So you have to be really, really careful that these athletes are matching their demands, especially when it comes to something like protein, because it's not going to manifest itself as a decrease in performance. It's going to manifest themselves as getting sick more frequently. And that's really interesting in the context of what we're currently living through. If we're not getting in enough and we're not making sure we're staying on top of this, we can have some major issues. Oh, wow, right ahead of there. That's pretty cool. So, at the end of the day, why do you think your demands are actually increased for protein over a sedentary person when you're an endurance athlete? Because resistance training makes perfect sense. We're trying to build more muscle. That's fine. Why do you think you have a greater protein demand if you're a long distance runner? Not a bad idea, Bree. Not a bad idea. You are going to use a little bit more protein for energy, but it's not going to be that big of it. Bingo. With all the running, you're doing a lot of micro trauma to your muscles and your tendons. It's not necessarily causing those muscles and tendons to get massive, obviously, but they are going to hypertrophy somewhat, and they're still going to have that turnover because they're having that damage done every single day. Good job, guys. Now, the resistance training, like I said, is pretty straightforward. And then the issue is when we're looking at it this way, guys, we're also doing a weird disservice because we're trying to say that, excuse me, human beings are in bucket A or bucket B. In reality, if we're to go ahead, because I know Taryn's on, do you consider a soccer player, and sorry, and Brie also, to be an endurance athlete or a resistance trained athlete? And can you guys see the chat? Yeah. Well, Bree is a goalie. Yeah. You're a resistance training athlete. Let's be honest. There's no endurance there, especially if your team is doing a good job, but for the most part, it's going to be both and specifically different periods of the year. So if you've got an off season soccer girl and you're trying to literally get her bigger, stronger, more powerful for the following season, you're going to be following more of the resistance training protein recommendations and in season, because we still have weights and otherwise, you know, maybe a midfielder, you'll treat a little bit more as an endurance athlete when it comes to protein recommendations, but you're still going to be on the higher end of that. And so we need to keep in mind athletes that have varying demands that obviously require both ends of the spectrum. So when in doubt, we probably want to be taking in protein on the higher end just to be safe, especially if we're trying to maintain, if not increase some muscle mass. And at the same time, always keep in mind in the context of all the other macronutrients, carbohydrates and fats. So what about timing? Now here's the thing. Once you digest, once you put the food in your mouth, swallow and digest it, the protein source is going to be completely digested in your bloodstream as in little of, as a half an hour to as much as eight hours. And so what we're going to find, if your goal is to increase muscle mass and have the best recovery, you want to separate your protein intake into multiple boluses over the day. With Notice I have the reference to Schoenfeld down there. And that was one of the more recent meta-analyses, I believe it was in 2018, where it seems that if you're doing protein in at least four different equal boluses over the course of the day, that's going to lead to the greatest total amount of muscle mass gain, or at least the best maintenance. Now, Timing meaning we do lunch, we do dinner, we do breakfast, and then we're going to go ahead and make sure that we incorporate some type of snack. Or this could be something before we go to bed, just depends on how long you stay up when you train. Because doing protein post-workout and or drinking it while you're working out, so it's in your bloodstream right when you're finishing your workout, is going to go ahead and help enhance your recovery from that training. Now, as far as the type of protein, as long as you're getting an adequate amount, it doesn't really seem to matter that much. 
Now, there's certain things that are going to go ahead and digest a lot more quickly, and that's going to be something like a whey protein. There's things that are going to digest far more slowly, and that's going to be like a casein protein or a number of different vegetable type proteins, just because the fiber and otherwise is going to slow it down. And especially if we're taking in protein with other nutrients, well, it turns out it's going to slow the digestion even more. It's called a meal. It's what hopefully everyone gets to eat more than one. By the way, guys, I don't know your realities that you find yourself in. We still have that crazy amount of protein powder in the lab. If any of you guys need any, you shoot me an email and I will just drag it and leave it kind of outside hidden a little bit on campus and just grab whatever you need. And if you know anybody that needs anything, because obviously things are weird right now, do not hesitate. We'll hook you guys up. Now, the amount of protein is the next big question, which is in a perfect world, you want to go ahead and take whatever the protein demands are and effectively divide it into even boluses over the day, depending on how many different meals you're taking. So for example, let's say you've got somebody that needs to take down 200 grams of protein per day. Your best bet is to divide that into four different meals of 50 grams of protein. That's it. And yeah, that equates to two scoops of whey protein. That equates to effectively, hey, Han, would that be about half a pound of chicken? Oh, sorry, what happened? For 50 grams of protein? Eight ounces, yeah. So you want to go ahead and uh, divide that according. My wife's a dietitian, so she's the one that knows more about nutrition than I do, but she specifically works with a lot of different populations. You want to meet the class, honey? I think she's going to come over and say hi. She's not, a, she's already met Norbert for a second. Say hello to the class that can see you. Hi. <laughs> Jackson Blair, Stephanie Schneider, and uh, Rebecca Arnold Q. I don't know why that's missing the Q in the end. So. <laughs> Good to meet y'all. And there's a bunch of already also in the chat. They're just not in the video. So, oh, okay. yeah, I'm talking about protein in a minute. So, oh, yes. You don't have the disease, do you? Social distancing. Yeah. Ours is a happy marriage, can you tell? So, any questions there on kind of the effects and the timing and so on? So we have over on the right, guys, is going to be actually protein turnover whenever we're taking in both protein and carbohydrates, specifically when we have people taking it in post-workout. It really is useful to get in protein post-workout or at least around the workout to help with not just getting your glycogen levels to recover, but also to replenish and sorry, to repair the damage that you've done to the muscular skeletal system from your training session. But it's not 100% like, dear God, you need to do it or you'll die. Instead, once again, think of it as you were dividing the protein up in even boluses over the day, preferentially in up to four. Once you go over four, the magnitude of effect is so much smaller, it doesn't really matter. But going from one giant protein meal to two, to three, to four, and then five, six, seven. The five, six, seven barely gives you any more extra. But going from one to two gives you a big adding. From two to three gives you another big addition. From three to four gives you even more. So there's nothing wrong with people that enjoy doing intermittent fasting, especially if you're doing it for health. But if you're trying to get as swole as humanly possible, you do want to divide up those meals over a longer time period for the day. If your goal is just to be healthy, you don't have to use these techniques. You could just have one giant meal per day, gorge yourself and be done, which sounds both epic and disturbing depending on how much you got to meal through. Now, what about using different amino acids as a form of being an ergogenic aid? It doesn't really make a difference. They don't really help that much. Arginine, in theory, can convert a little bit more into nitric oxide, which gives you vasodilation. But the amino acid citrulline is going to be the one that has the bigger effect. That's effectively going to give you a greater pump when you're working out. Branched chain amino acid acids are going to help with increasing signaling for muscle mass, effectively, once you get done or when you're doing resistance training. But branched chain amino acids, specifically leucine, is going to be the most important one it's going to be as long as you're getting in a whole protein source. And that's why whey protein, which I know is a fraction of milk, is going to be the one that seemingly has the greatest positive effect on actually helping you increase that muscle mass and recover faster from training. Now, there's a lot of talk about glutamine and having its positive effects on performance. Nothing out there is really shown to be that efficacious, but what it does seem to have a positive effect on is actually a little bit with immune health but also with digestive system health, since glutamine is often used as an energy source in your digestive tract. 
Your other different amino acids doesn't really seem to have that great of effect. Tyrosine is going to be a precursor to your stress hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So that could be useful. Well, catecholamine, sorry, not cortisol, stress hormones. Taurine, like we, show, we showed earlier how it's going to be an important in component of glutathione, but that's not really going to be a limiting factor. And tryptophan is actually a precursor for uh, serotonin. So some folks taking a greater amount of that kind of helps them relax a little bit. That's part of the argument where you can have the, like, not the turkey hangover, but, you know, be a real tired after you do a lot of turkey on Thanksgiving. But that's probably more due to insulin and massively high blood sugar levels. And uh, yeah, protein in intake and being a health risk, it's not really a risk. It's really been demonized because the foundational research talking about how protein is dangerous when you take in too much was absolutely correct in that it was in one specific population. Guess what that population was? It, it was what a high protein intake is actually been shown to have negative effects on their health. And it's not the elderly. It's definitely not bodybuilders. College kids. It's individuals with kidney disease. If your kidneys aren't working, you shouldn't be mainlining anything, much less protein, which is, yes, causes your kidneys to work a little harder. So yes, if you have kidney failure, you should be pretty damn mindful of how much protein you're taking in. But the rest of us, not so much. In fact, speaking of bodybuilders, one of the favorite, uh, my recent work or literature that I've seen, I got to see his uh, talk, Jose Antonio out of uh, Nova down in Florida. He did a study where he had people taking on average 3.5 grams of protein per day per kilogram of body mass for two years, and they blood tested them pre, peri, and post, and they had no negative effects on their blood lipid profile, on their resting blood pressure, their heart rate, any other health outcome. They didn't have a loss of bone mineral density. They actually had a slight increase in lean mass and a slight loss in fat mass compared to their control group. So high, Oh, nice job, Becca. We saw the renal failure. It's not going to be an issue of protein intake in healthy individuals. It's in unhealthy individuals. It was really cool at Jose Antonio's speech uh, at the National Conference this past summer I got to go to. He had two case studies, one of a female bodybuilder that, or fit, uh, figure competitor. So she's not uh, using vitamin S. She's still, you know, obviously a very jacked female, but nothing crazy. They, just for fun, he asked her to see how much protein she could do in one day. She did 700 grams of protein over the course of a day. The thing that she complained about the most is she just hated having to eat that much plain chicken, but didn't end up in the hospital. Absolutely fine. And then he, he had one bodybuilder who weighed about 220 pounds that the guy did literally just over a thousand grams of protein in one day. And no negative health count outcomes other than probably the next day on the toilet was less than optimal. So protein, high protein intakes and health risks are not gonna be a problem when you're working with healthy people. Now, if you're working with people that are already unhealthy, that have kidney problems that have high blood pressure, yeah, just you know, make sure that they're not going too heavy or too hard in the paint. But in reality, we should also be mindful, make sure that they're not taking too much carbohydrate. And we're also being mindful of their fat sources if they're not taking it too much. What questions do you guys have about protein intake before we start talking a little bit about fluid balance? And then we call it a night. I just hit that one out of the park. No one's got any questions? 
Speak now or forever hold your peace. Sounds good. Let's close you up. And I'll save that. So, oh, Will's typing. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Yeah, go ahead, Will. You can unmute yourself if you have audio. Okay, I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, go for it, bud. Okay, sweet. I'm a really slow typer. Um, I believe you just touched on this, or are you explaining it? But just so with these individuals with kidney problems, renal failure, things like that, mm -hmm. um, what would they need to be mindful of. So, you know, consuming the protein, like just eat, eat less protein in general, just less amounts of it. Bingo. And not only that, but as we'll get into later with electrolytes is being mindful of how much sodium, potassium, and because the fluid balances the issue because your kidneys are naturally regulating your osmolarity. You know, you're peeing accordingly to how much salt you're taking in, how much fluid you're taking in. So hence, you're not taking in fluid. You're going to hold on to your water when you are. You're going to usually get rid of it. But if that's not functioning correctly, urine and urea and creatinine are going to be things that require a little bit more energy from your kidneys to effectively process and get them out. Well, filter, filter out. And so like anything else, if we know our filters aren't working very well, let's not try to push more things through a filter than what it's meant to do or than what it's ready to do. Your average person from what I've seen is usually working at only about 20% of their total kidneys potential. So hence, increasing their protein intake isn't going to kill them because it's, you're going from 20% to maybe 30 or 40, you're fine. But if you've got somebody that's, can't, they already are, can, can't even hold on to normal daily life, they're over their 100% ability, if we throw even more on there, like, sweet Jesus, we're gonna really risk messing people up. So the goal is with anybody is obviously to make sure that you're gonna get them better and not hurt them. So with the protein recommendations, it's really simple. We just make sure there's protein with every single meal, and for your initial person, when they're going from being sedentary to active, like, you know what, we're going to go ahead and dial up their protein a little bit by just making sure they do some type of post-workout nutrition that's got, you know, a protein chip. It doesn't have to be anything complex. Or it can be, well, think of your average American's breakfast. If we decided to eat whatever we see just on freaking TV, what are most people eating for breakfast? Well, I know McDonald's is a popular choice. Yeah. Which, you know, to be fair, if you do the sausage biscuit with egg, you know, that's an option. But brie, exactly. Cereal, oatmeal, bagel, donut. Pretty much we do straight carbs with a little bit of fat. So instead it's like, hey, for breakfast, let's try to eat, you know, two or three eggs. Let's try and in, have some form of protein that you want to. You could get the high protein oatmeal. Like it exists. Like there's a lot of options, but just make sure they have protein with that meal. Because most Americans tend to do a pretty good job of having meat, definitely at lunch and definitely at dinner. So that's not gonna be an issue of not getting enough protein, but we don't need to go from a normal diet to now we're doing a dozen eggs for breakfast, two T-bone steaks for lunch, and then like a small flock of chickens for dinner. Like instead, let's just increase it a little bit. That's probably gonna help increase satiety, which is good because you're gonna feel full. They're not gonna be as hungry. And at the same time, let's get them to be doing some resistance training so we can increase the lean mass and that helps us get into the core deficit that we talked about. So, Thank you. So fluids, um, we're mostly water. And as you would figure, it turns out that uh, the scaling of it depends on the size of you. So babies, aside from being useless little poop monsters, are mostly water. And Becca, you had that niece you had to take care of, right? Or you're not, not take care of, but you got to be around your niece and everything. Were you around her when she was like really, really little? Whenever you're ready, Becca. Anytime now. Or she just left, it's okay. Yeah, I was around her when she was little. What's the first bowel movements look like from little kids? It's like black. And is it formed or is it kind of everywhere? It's everywhere. Bingo. Because also the microbiome hasn't started yet. And because of that, it's mostly just fluid that's rushing through them. And that's why 
dehydration from diarrhea is such a bad thing in little kids because they don't have much reserves. They don't have anything extra built up in the body. They're so small. And, you know, as we're older, lean mass is mostly made of water. But what's really interesting is your fat cells are actually going to be from anywhere from as less than 10% of water to as high as 50 to 60% is made of water. So hence why you can lose weight and still have fat because those fat cells are there, but they're mostly empty because they want to be refilled. And that's part of the reason why when people zigzag, lose weight, and gain weight, they can easily overshoot because they not just refill those fat cells, those fat cells divide and then they fill up again and they divide and it's really hard to get rid of fat cells once you have them. So any questions about where we're holding? Actually, when we say intracellular water, that makes perfect sense. That's literally the water inside your cells. Really easy. When I say extracellular fluid, what are we talking about there, guys? Outside the cells. Thank you, Courtney. What could be an example of an extracellular fluid? Great, Daniel. Plasma, so your blood plasma, synovial fluid, the water that's inside of your digestive tracts of the chyme and otherwise, all of those are going to be examples of extracellular fluid. Now, what then is interstitial fluid? Yeah, the fluid outside the cells doesn't work now, does it, Courtney? I mean, technically, you're still right, but I'm wanting it to be a little more direct. No, Courtney, you did a great job. Ask a stupid question, get a direct and accurate answer. CSF. Oh, cerebral spinal fluid. Nice job, guys. That's still an extracellular fluid. Yes, we do have a slight amount of fluid that's outside of our cells. Okay. Interstitial fluid. If you guys ever have scraped yourself, and not because you, you know, you popped a vein or popped an artery and blood's literally like shooting out of you. But notice that eventually you get just a little bit of fluid showing up on the surface. That's that interstitial fluid. So we naturally have a little bit around all of our tissues that allows them to slide back and forth across each other. So it is technically a form of extracellular fluid, but it's going to be everything that's wrapping around. So it allows those cells to move by each other. Because imagine if we didn't have that natural lubrication, not just the synovial fluid in our joint, but literally just allowing our muscles to slide over one another. Imagine if you had the same friction inside of your arms or inside of your own muscles moving over each other that you do, sorry, overshare, like for people like me between my legs when I walk. That's why my thighs eat pants. It's a real problem. And I'm sure a couple other people also have that reality. And we have that natural fluid there which allows things to slide without generating that friction. Ruh -ruh. Somehow I went all the way back to the beginning of the chat. Okay, so the biggest way that we're losing our fluid is straight up thermoregulation. So it turns out when we start exercising, we're going to be burning calories, increase our body temperature. Our body then wants to go ahead and get us to get rid of this energy because it turns out our blood is circulating everywhere in our body. So we're going to see the greatest amount of heat storage really in that torso. It's all getting pulled in through the middle and or in those muscles that we're really using for exercise. We're then going to be getting heat from our environment, which is not so much today with the wonders of the grayest of blue skies, but hopefully soon enough when it becomes warm outside, it turns out we're going to go ahead and be getting a lot from the day star. And between that and the equipment we're wearing for the sport, along with how hard we're training, we're going to need to start sweating just like we've talked about in exercise physiology. And what you guys have learned about before, we talked about cardiovascular drift. As we're sweating out more and more fluid, in turn, we are going to go ahead and have an increase in our heart rate because we've decreased our stroke volume, which makes the exercise even more demanding than it was before. So we're regulating that body temperature through a number of different temperature receptors in the brain that once we go too high, they actually shut down. And that's when we're getting ourselves into heat stroke. 
And like anything else, our body is going to adapt to the demands placed upon it. So when we talk about, yes, the increase in body temperature from exercise, this causes us to sweat. How does the body acclimate to warmer temperatures? What does it do? Yes, it does sweat, Daniel. But in what way do we get better at sweating? More often, absolutely will. So we're gonna be sweating more than we did beforehand. Different areas, general efficiency of cooling operation. Okay, the general efficiency of sweating stays about the same, but we do a good job. Remember guys, there's three different things. One, we sweat more. Two, we sweat earlier. So when our body temperature starts to rise, we start sweating at an earlier point than we would have otherwise. And then three is we are going to be sweating less concentrated. So we're not losing as much sodium. We're not losing as much potassium. We're not gonna be losing as much electrolytes. We're still losing as much fluid. Okay, we're still losing as much water but we're not depleting our electrolytes as quickly. And that's a good adaptation because it turns out we're going to be able to maintain our exercise output longer. And at the same time, we're gonna be more efficient. So yes, honey, I know I'm excessively sweaty, but that's because I'm so well adapted. Sorry, my wife's walking around down here. Okay, now what do we know about dehydration? Turns out you tend to suck at everything you're going to see a decrease in aerobic function. You're going to see a decrease in, in total capacity, so distance that people can go. You're going to go ahead and see pretty much everything going down in a bad way the more we go without getting hydration. That's pretty straightforward. But what's more important is not the fact of like, when you're hot, you sweat, and when you keep sweating, you can get hurt, through the wonders of a myriad of things outside of just heat stroke and heat exhaustion, but you literally are going to have an increase in reactive oxidative species and reactive nitrogenous species thanks to the overstressing of your digestive tract, which in turn increases your gut permeability, which can cause endotoxemia and not just a decrease in blood pressure, but with a tissue injury through heat illness, you can effectively give yourself diarrhea or indigestion or anything else along those lines. Along with it turns out, all of our tissues like to operate within certain temperature ranges. Muscles do work better at higher temperatures, but what we're going to find is that they are going to be the outliers. Most of our other tissues like to be cooler. That's the reason why your body normally is at 98.6 plus or minus one or two degrees depending on your own physiology. So, Sorry, the cats are eating dinner, so I'm always kind of entertained by them. So what we're more interested in is making sure that we prepare our athletes appropriately and they replenish them aggressively and effectively when they've had that fluid loss. So as you'd expect, it turns out if we do a good job of giving lots of fluid to our athletes, we look down here compared to the small fluid, and this is time trial which is what most sports are. We're trying to get things done as fast as possible, okay? If we're giving them lots of fluid with another energy source, so this would be carbohydrate, we are in turn going to be able to do better than if we got a smaller fluid amount. Now, what's also important is when we're giving them a drink, we want it to be what's known as hypotonic. Hypotonic meaning it has a lower amount of electrolytes in it than what we naturally find in the body. That allows it to be taken up far more easily. And that in general, if you give folks just fluid compared to an isotonic drink, they're actually, this is a fatigue, so go as far as you can before you fall apart, you're actually gonna do better with, once again, something that's diluted compared to what your body naturally happens to be in. And also be mindful of the sweat loss. So this is just some information of just varying sports to give you an idea of fluid uh, loss that you're gonna find from various athletes. It really depends on each individual, and then obviously the intensity of which they happen to be training at. Uh, myself and my GAs, and sometimes the interns for, we do the 9-11 stair climb. Uh, this past fall, I did it with uh, TJ Dozier and his wife, um, 
and it literally took us, I think it, cause it's a little over a hundred stories. It took us like 95 minutes. And at the end of it, I had lost eight pounds, which is a gallon of water because it turns out wearing firefighting gear and walking to nowhere on a treadmill is pretty, is pretty thermodynamically uh, intensive. So you naturally have the greater fluid loss, but where you look at other sports like soccer, Taryn, did you ever have a good idea of how much weight you lose over like a really hard, long practice in August? And then same thing, Bree, or anyone else that's really had to do two a days or any type of sport in the summer, two or three pounds. And that's, you guys also are given breaks to actually drink water. It's not like you would just, you know, say that, uh, you know, water makes you weak or some other nonsense. That's with getting in as much water as you pretty much wanted to outside of obviously something that would induce a cramp. Sound about right to you guys? Now, here's the thing. Still having a two to three pound loss, what we're then going to see is we want to take in fluid wise about one and a half times what we lost. Because like anything, the human body's not 100% efficient. A certain amount of that fluid is going to be lost because we're just not able to use it osmolarity wise. The kidneys are going to get rid of it. And the other thing is when you do just a giant bolus of water, as opposed to taking consistent sips over long periods of time, how many of you guys have naturally found yourself because you try to just chug a bunch of water all at once, 20 minutes later, you're going to the bathroom and you're putting it all in the toilet. Okay. Sound vaguely familiar? Chugging water before squats. You know, I mean, to be fair, animals mark their territory. So if you're to chug a bunch of water before you squat, I'm pretty sure if you pee on the platform, that's pretty much your way of saying that it's yours, right? No? No? Okay. Fair enough. No, but absolutely, guys. Oh, God. Pretty sure you don't have to worry about the wreck right now because it's closed down. So, furthermore, turns out dehydration is bad. Don't do it. And like anything else, we need to base it on the individual because you're going to find some athletes are what's known as a salty sweater. They literally lose more electrolytes when they're sweating compared to other people. Uh, some of them learn this pretty early on because they're the ones that cramp up pretty easy. They sometimes literally have salt crystals, uh, crystals on the side of their face if they're exercising out in the sun. And at the same time, you do, which you guys, that's a great thing of doing pre post practice weights. So you get an idea of who are the kids that are purging more weight and is it because they're not drinking water or is it simply because they are the ones that sweat a lot more because there's some genetics to it, okay? And obviously adaptation on top of that. Now, what can we do to go ahead and enhance performance? Well, it turns out aside from making sure that we're giving fluids when we're training, it's to go into competition or go into practice hyperhydrated. So had to been actively thinking about getting in more water for the hours leading up to the game so that we're walking in effectively at the fullest tank we can. So if we sweat two or three pounds off, we're still just back down to our normal weight because we were holding more water than we needed to. And you can do this by making sure we're getting in electrolytes. And once again, not doing it in giant boluses, but doing it in consistent slow intakes. And what we have here on the right, guys, is an idea of how much of the different, now this is millimoles, so we can use good old Avogadro's number and multiply that accordingly to figure out how much milligrams of each of these different uh, minerals you're losing in your sweat. But it's important to understand, it's not just sodium potassium. It's gonna be calcium, it's gonna be magnesium. Those are going to be incorporated into our sweat. So we do need to make sure if we're sweating excessively, we're not just focusing on getting in a lot of table salt. We've got more to it that we need to make sure that we're getting in. Now, during exercise, based on the exercise intensity and the tolerance of the athlete, how many of you guys know if you ever try to just sip water when you're going for a run or playing basketball, you're going to cramp up and you're going to have a bad time? I can only see three faces, and most of them are just staring at me blankly. Except for Will, at least he's smiling. Okay, I appreciate that, but uh, yeah, at the end of the day, some folks are gonna have a hard time drinking water while they're training. And so it's important, like I said, that we walk into it hyperhydrated. Now, where's the problem with this? Because what time of day are most of us typically the most dehydrated we're gonna be 
if we're not gonna work out that day? Yes, absolutely guys. First thing when you get out of bed all night, you haven't eaten or drinking anything for eight hours, hopefully at least eight hours, if not more. And because of that, you're gonna be mildly dehydrated. Now, when do a lot of our athletes have training sessions and specifically sometimes hard conditioning? Go figure. And so this is problematic because what we're telling the athlete to do is if we tell you to try to do a giant amount of water right before you go to bed, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's really hard to have good sleep if you got to wake up every two or three hours to go pee. So, yeesh. In reality, you just want to say like, hey, you know, sip on water, make sure you try to drink a little bit of water before you go to bed, figure out how much you can tolerate and is it going to have you waking up to go to the bathroom. But if you do wake up to go to the bathroom, try to make sure you drink a little bit of water. If you wake up in the middle of the night, try to drink a little bit of water, something so we can make sure they're effectively as topped off as they can. And then the second you wake up, first thing you should do is just drink a solid, almost liter of water if you can, just to get your body closer to rehydration. So that way, when you go out there for practice, you're at least going to be a little bit closer to being at a normal level, if not, you know, not as dehydrated as you would have been otherwise. So every single day, we've got the fluid coming in and the fluid going out. Now, the fluid coming in, we think of water immediately, but the other thing is food. A lot of different food sources have a pretty high water content. In fact, some of them, the first name, uh, or the first part of the name for the food involves water. So you can pretty much guess what it's mostly made up of. Yeah, go figure. Your fruits, your vegetables, your watermelon, your cantaloupes, all of those are going to be really high fluid content. What foods can you guys eat that are really, really low water content? And I swear to God, none of you guys say like pixie sticks. Because yeah, that's straight sugar, but you're better than that. Or a stick of butter, you're better than that. Good. Chips can definitely be one that's got a really low fluid content. Bread, depending on how it's made, absolutely. Yeah, try to do the saltine challenge. Nuts are going to be mostly, are very low in water. Jerky is going to be very low in water. But most of the other foods we're getting, they're going to have a decent amount. Now, metabolic, remember guys, one of the products from natural metabolism isn't just carbon dioxide, but it's actually H2O. So we're producing a little bit every single day. Now, that's all of our fluid gain. Now, fluid going out, we've got our breath, which... So, so social isolation, stay, stay six feet away from everybody. And we've got however much we're losing through our skin from sweat. There's going to be a certain amount in feces. And if there's not, it's called constipation. And that's a bad time. Too much, it's called diarrhea. And that's a bad time. And then obviously we're going to have urine. The goal is that we're staying in balance, that we're keeping our hydration levels relatively even and specifically our body fluid levels. Because here's the problem. If you have an athlete, so let's say we're talking about that soccer gal. She gets up, she goes to practice right before practice starts. She has to get her pre-weight. She knows the coach is going to give her trouble if she's not hitting the weight she is. So she just chugs half a gallon of water, okay? Steps on the scale. She's at the weight she needs to be. She just got done chugging that water. Where is all that water? Bingo. It's in the stomach. It's not in her joints, in her synovial fluid. It's not in her intervertebral discs. It's not in her bloodstream. It's not in all the areas that are going to actually help her performance. Instead, it's just sitting in her stomach. And it's going to, yeah, it's going to diffuse out there, guys. But that diffusion takes time. And so because of that, we have to be mindful of when we're taking in these fluids and making sure that the athlete's getting what they need. Then we've got a giant monkey wrench that throws off the total amount of body water, which is hormones. And specifically, what type of hormones are going to massively cause water retention on occasion? Antidiuretic hormone, and you're right, aldosterone are going to play into it along with ACE and ACE2. Oh, there's, there's definitely a couple other that are, can really throw off fluid levels. Cortisol, a little bit, but not so much, but our wonderful sex hormones. How many, well, I guess you can't really stay uh, anonymous right now since everyone can see your name whenever you text or whenever you send, put anything in the chat, 
but how many of you guys know of a lady that went on some form of oral birth control and put on five pounds of water weight overnight or 10 pounds of water weight overnight? All that is just being modified through increasing her ability to hold on to. Oh yeah, you actually know it's not a myth, Will. Creatine actually causes water retention because it increases the osmolarity of your muscles, so it pulls more water into them, so it actually causes fluid retention. And that's the reason why creatine, as we're gonna get into supplements later on, are going to, it's gonna be one of the supplements that I would honestly give to everybody, except for long distance runners. And the reason for it is that, that extra water retention is now more weight they have to carry for a longer distance. It doesn't really help them because that energy system is so unimportant for that sport that it turns out they're gonna be okay if they're just increasing their carbohydrate intake and then depleting their fluid a little bit while they're also depleting their glycogen, which is naturally gonna help with giving them that hyperhydration effect. So really, really good question, okay? And so as you suspect, guys, everybody tends to do better as long as you're not getting dehydrated from whatever they're doing. And if you're an athlete, your fluid intake is typically going to be higher, especially if you're exercising in warm environments. And if you happen to be wearing equipment, that makes it really harder to thermoregulate. So if we're all gonna go out there and play beach volleyball, it turns out you're wearing minimal clothing, so it's really easy to thermoregulate. Yeah, you're gonna be sweating, but you're gonna be fine. You compare that to a football player, you see they're wearing all that equipment, it makes it that much harder for them to make sure they're doing a really good job of losing that body heat through evaporation and not having to retain so much of it through radiation of the equipment keeping their own body heat inside of them. Now, when we're taking a look at the drinks, we're really looking for something, remember, that's either slightly hypo or isotonic, because that's gonna allow for a faster regain. Now, this can be problematic because it turns out if we're trying to go higher in the carbohydrate intake and it's not that warm and they're not sweating that much, we can easily be oversaturating the beverage and that makes it a lot harder for them to palate along with keep down. Now, as far as rehydration, we want to start that immediately. We're going to be rehydrating them during the exercise. And then as far as when we're looking at the total amount of fluid, it's going to be based upon the weight loss and usually about an effect of one and a half times what they normally or what they lost during that exercise session. So that's why doing pre-post weights can be really useful. But when in doubt, just make sure that athletes are constantly drinking fluid. Because anytime they don't have it available, turns out they're probably going to go without it, and they're going to be more likely to have some type of negative outcome. Because it's really dumb to have a hamstring strain, pull, or tear because your fluids were, or sorry, because your tissues were slightly dehydrated, so they had a greater amount of friction, they had a lower amount of pliability, and they ripped because you were dehydrated. So. When we're giving athletes fluids after exercise, always keep in mind, what do they prefer? Do they like hypertonic solutions? Do they like isotonic? Do they like hypo? Perfect world is going to be hypo and iso. But if anything, you're just looking for them to keep it down. So if they don't like Gatorade, give them water. If they don't like water and they like Gatorade, give them Gatorade. Who cares? But at the end of the day, you just got to make sure that you're matching the demands with what the body needs. You guys all know about sweating. Turns out that's gonna be the major loss. And even when we're working out in cold weather, you're gonna be sweating a little bit, you're gonna have a little bit of fluid loss, but nowhere near to the same scalability. What, any questions you guys have about hydration that you want me to go ahead and cover? And otherwise, we're gonna be good to go. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm just gonna to try to do these presentations at four o'clock on Tuesdays. I still am gonna be, obviously, you can get a hold of me via email and I'll go ahead and put all these up on YouTube so you can watch them later if you can't be on. If you have other questions you want me to go ahead and field, literally when I put on YouTube, just write it as a comment. I'll shoot another little video in the, as we call it, the green room in the house. And maybe one of the other pets will make an appearance at some point. Uh, questions, comments, concerns? Quizzes obviously now are take home. We're gonna keep that open a lot. Uh, honestly, yeah, you can email it to me, Will, or like I said, you can just put it as a comment on YouTube because it's weird. I, okay, full transparency, as you can tell, you now see my YouTube channel where I put a bunch of random sh stuff up there. A, because I need to have a way to send bigger videos to friends and they've got questions about things, so I just put it up on that. And there are some people that I do consulting with on occasion. There is a small and mildly terrifying subset of individuals that really, really like watching people 
in piggyback rides and fireman carries. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I've had some very unique comments and questions and I'm, I'm really hoping it's just, you know, it's somebody that's like, it, it makes them happy to watch a piggyback ride, but not like happy in the bedroom sense, like happy and like, you know, it just makes them like a joyous person to watch, you know, two dudes give each other a piggyback ride. Oh, but I'd be very happy to actually have some comments on my YouTube site that isn't people like, dude, wait to deadlift whatever weight back in the day, who cares? And said like, hey, what do you think about this? Because that will be a far better email to get. Yeah, seriously, there's somebody wanted us to shoot like an hour long video, I was doing a piggyback ride. So I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah, I, I don't have a YouTube account or anything. So I was just planning emailing you if that's viable. Yeah, man, that's fine. The email's fine, guys. Whatever way you guys can contact me, um, I'm going to probably put my, uh, on a, I'm not going to say this because it's going on YouTube, but up on um, my, uh, on Blackboard, I'm going to throw my cell phone number up there. So if you guys want, shoot me a text, just so we're clear, any of you guys ever can call me in the middle of the night and you're drunk, I will find a way to fail you. Okay. My, my wife and I, back when I was a strength coach at SLU, unfortunately turns out with the first name of Mike. And they didn't put me in as coach Mike or anything like that. They just put me as Mike. I got a lot of drunk dials from a lot of kids. And a number of them were on the dance team. And I got some things from them that I did not want. And my wife saw that. And we had a lot of issues. But I never wanted that. But I got that. And I don't want that. Okay? So you guys invite your other friend Mike out to the bars. I'm old. And I'm, and I'm staying in social isolation as much as I hate it. So uh, – any questions from anybody in the chat about anything that we covered tonight or any other expectations for uh, the rest of the semester? So I know we've got Bree. Oh, Chad's here. Daniel's here. Haley. Josh is here. Justin's here. Oh, nice. Nice, guys. Yes. In theory, this meeting is supposed to happen every single week, so it'll be like the same chat room but I'll make sure that I, you know, put that up there uh, on the announcements. And like I said, guys, if you can't watch it, it's okay. I'm not taking attendance for this stuff. Instead, it's just, I want to make sure that we get this material, you guys understand it, and that I'm able to answer your questions. And then to the best of my ability, we can still do this thing online. So speaking of which, Sam had a great question. And I think Courtney, you guys both asked about the dietary modification. If everything wouldn't have gone to a uh, heck in a handbasket over the past two weeks, the basic goal was for you guys to take and modify your own diet in one way, shape, or form for a week, you know, the one week you got back from spring break, and just see what happened. You know, just write a little bit about it, see how it feels. Like, we've had some folks try a vegetarian diet. We've had some folks try to drink more water, you know, using the good old fast and uh, simple SMART goals, specific, most of all attainable, uh, was it repeatable, timely? And they are means something you guys can fill me in. But that's the basic idea with the dietary modification. Honestly, I'm not going to have you guys worry about it too much. But actually, let's see if I can bring this up. Your paper still be due with you. Yeah, your paper's still going to be due. Um, do, do, do. Give me one second. So I got to go to my Google Drive, and I'm going to go ahead and also put this up for you guys. This is for fun, but at the end of the semester, whoever comes up with the best one is going to go ahead and get extra, uh, just like two to three points of extra credit. Sorry, I'm currently on my other screen, which obviously has the, uh, has my, uh, camera on it. So now it looks like I'm staring at you guys a lot more intensely. Okay, sweet. So this is up on Google Drive. Okay. And this is what's known as the, uh, it's just bio, oh, here we go. Minimize you. Bioenergetic macronutrient extra credit. Okay. So what you're going to go ahead and do is figure out for each of these components all the way down at the very bottom here of what is going to be the cheapest form to get a certain amount of this calorie in. So what's gonna be our best bang for a buck? And it's not just things like carbs, but then it's gonna be things like total iron intake, total magnesium intake, calcium intake. And so from there, it's meant to be fun where you guys can effectively 
Yes. Go ahead and literally just try to find, hey, here is the best food sources that I could find per my dollar for a gram of protein, for a gram of carbohydrate, for a gram of fat. If you win any of them, you get, uh, we'll say two points of extra credit for each of them. And I literally have pretty much every vitamin mineral along with carbs, fats, and protein and omega-3 fatty acids on there also. So there's a lot of things you can go on there. Just write in whatever you did. I do have it set so I can see the edits that people have made. So if you try to delete somebody else's or anything like that, that is quite the faux pas. And just have fun. I think I'm going to throw on one more on there, which is going to be something that has arguably like the best nutrition. So if we're looking at the overall RDLs of each vitamin and mineral, what's your best choice of what to eat per gram? Um, and uh, yeah, any other questions you guys have? Anything else I can kind of cover since I feel I've probably bored you enough and you're going to go back to the Netflix and chill until Armageddon's over so we can go outside again. No questions? Thank you guys for showing up. Um, if you have questions, things are weird. Uh, I don't like it and I'm, I'm sure you guys don't like it too. And we can definitely, we can sit down and chat um, anytime you guys want. Uh, and uh, yeah, stay safe out there guys. And I will hopefully see you guys again in person at some point. And yeah, have a great night, guys. Bye-bye.